deviation. The decay of the workers' movement is corroborated by the official optimism of its adherents. This seems to grow with the immovable consolation or consolidation of the capitalist world. The founders of the movement never regarded success as guaranteed and therefore throughout their lives said dire things to the workers' organizations. Today, when the enemy's power and control over the consciousness of the masses has been immeasurably strengthened, the attempt radically to alter this consciousness by withholding assent to it is considered reactionary. Suspicion falls on anyone who combines criticism of capitalism with that of the proletariat, which is more and more becoming a mere reflection of the tendencies of capitalist development. Once it crosses class boundaries, the negative element of thought is frowned upon. Kaiser Wilhelm's words of wisdom, I tolerate no Jeremiah's, have penetrated the ranks of those he wanted to crush. Anyone who pointed, for example, to the lack of any spontaneous resistance by the German workers was told in reply that things were so much in a state of flux that such judgments were impossible. Anyone who was not on the spot, right among the poor German victims of aerial warfare, victims, however, who had few objections to air raids as long as they were directed at the other side, had no right to open his mouth, and in any case, agrarian reforms were imminent in Romania and Yugoslavia, yet the further the rational expectation diminishes that society's doom can really be averted, the more reverently they repeat the old prayers, masses, solidarity, party, class struggle. While not a single idea in the critique of political economy is firmly believed any longer by the adherents of the left-wing platform, while their newspapers daily and witlessly trumpet forth theses that outdo all revisionism, yet signify nothing, and can be replaced at will tomorrow by the opposite, the ears of the faithful party liners show a musician's sensitivity to the faintest disrespect for the slogans that have jettisoned theory. Hurrah optimism has a fitting counterpart in international patriotism. The staunch supporter must swear allegiance to a people, no matter which. In the dogmatic concept of the people, however, the acceptance of an alleged common destiny between men as the authority for action, the idea of a society liberated from the compulsion of nature, is implicitly denied. Even this frantic optimism is the perversion of a motif that has been that has seen better days. The refusal to wait. Confidence in the state of technology made people see change as imminent, a palpable possibility. Conceptions entailing long intervals of time, precautions, elaborate measures for public enlightenment were suspected of abandoning the goal they claimed to pursue. At that time, optimism amounting to a disregard for death expressed an autonomous will. All that is left is its shell. Belief in the power and greatness of the organization as such, devoid of any willingness for individual action, indeed imbued with the destructive conviction that while spontaneity is no longer possible, the Red Army will win in the end. The constantly enforced insistence that everybody should admit that everything will turn out well places those who do not under suspicion of those who do not under suspicion of being defeatists and deserters. In the fairy tale, the toads who came from the depths were messengers of great joy. Today, when the abandonment of utopia looks as much like its realization as the Antichrist resembles the paraclete, toad has become a term of abuse among those who are themselves in the depths. The optimism of the left repeats the insidious bourgeois superstition that one should not talk of the devil but look on the bright side. The gentleman does not find the world to his liking? Then let him go and look for a better one, such as the popular parlance of socialist realism.